And now let's bring in the roundtable to weigh in Republican Congressman Adam Kinziger from Illinois, Maryland Democratic Congresswoman Donna Edwards, Peter Baker from The New York Times, author of the new book, Days of Fire, Bush and Cheney in the White House, and ABC's Matthew Dowd. And I want to start with you, Representative Kinzinger. Just react to what you heard from those Tea Party supporters. Those are some genuine emotions. Oh, sure. There's a lot of passion out there. We're a country $17 trillion in debt, and this has to stop. Um, my concern with what's going on, and we saw the interview with Ted Cruz and everything, is we're seeing conservatism, in essence, being redefined in this country. And it's not being redefined by Ted Cruz. It's being redefined by some of these outside groups, your Heritage Action, your Club for Growth, your Freedom Works. And you have a small group in Congress that has really become the Surrender Caucus. They've surrendered their voting card to the wishes of these outside groups. My voting card says Illinois 16th District. And that's who I represent. Let, let, let me ask both of you, and it's essentially what I asked Nancy Pelosi as well. Aren't you humiliated by this week? Aren't you ashamed? The country looks at Congress, all of you, and they're disgusted. Well, Are I you think... ashamed this week? Let's start with you on that. Yeah. I mean, this has been a bad, this has been a bad chapter from October 1st to the day we reopened. I mean, this is, you, you look at America's the most powerful country in the world, and that's something that I'm very proud to say. Um, but when you look at what's going on, I had a friend in Europe that just wrote me and he says, I don't understand what's happening. Are you guys going to stay powerful? Are you guys going to stay together? You got to work this out. This has got to happen. It's time for us to come together. And I'm looking forward to it because the president said if we reopen government, he's coming to the negotiating table. So I'm excited to see him there. Is, is that possible, Representative Edwards? And, and we got the Wall Street Journal saying 60 percent of people want to replace all members of Congress. Well, I understand that, but I mean, I'm proud to represent the 4th District of Maryland and an awful lot of federal workers and to join with 200 of my colleagues among Democrats who voted to reopen government and pay our bills. What really is sad is that 62 percent of the Republican caucus, I thought it was a small number. It turns out 144 members of the Republican caucus in the House of Representatives actually voted against reopening government, government and paying our bills. And so it isn't just a small group that's being driven. It's a larger group that's being driven, and I think that that should concern all Americans. But, but everybody has to move forward, Matthew Dowd. We've got all these new deadlines. Do you have any hope that those deadlines will be met and that this won't be an exact rerun? How does Boehner handle yeah, I, I don't. Th I, I think we're headed towards the same exact thing, because what they did is they bailed a little bit of water out of a sinking boat and never fix the holes and the holes of the boat are the, the dysfunction and the incredible polarization and the divisiveness that exists in Washington. I think that folks in Washington haven't come to terms with the gulf that exists between what goes on in Washington and what goes on in the rest of the country. And we can blame this on 40 Tea Party members. We can blame this on crazy stuff Ted Cruz says and does. And we can blame this on a lot of people. But the problem is, is average Americans sit out there and says, the federal government is not meeting my hopes, dreams, and needs whatever partisan makeup they are in that. And they see Washington, and this is where the Republicans, I think, have been really bad about this, as representing the status quo, as representing, okay, that's fine, we'll try to cut this, but we're going to have this big government program, but we're going to do the best job we can. And the establishment Republicans represent the status quo, which gives, gives source and oxygen to this movement out there of people that say, enough's enough. If you're going to do it the wrong way, then just as soon shut the government down. That problem has not been fixed. Peter Baker. Days of Fire. It's about Bush Cheney. It could be the title of the last two weeks right, as certainly. well. But <laughs> what what lessons can you learn from this book about what's happening now? What lessons could President Obama learn? What lessons could Speaker Boehner learn? Well, that's a very good question. I think what's really interesting is this is not George W. Bush's Republican Party right now. It's not what he would have wanted, I don't think. He's staying quiet in Dallas. He's not participating in the political discourse right now. But I think privately he talks to friends and, and, and advisors, and he's, he's really just concerned about this Tea Party movement. Even in his last years of office, he talked about uh, a growing isolationism that he spotted in the country and a growing sort of nihilism out there that he was worried about. And he, he believed, you know, he talked about compassionate conservatism. He believed in working with Democrats on some things as much as they fought during uh, their uh, tenure, particularly on national security. They, he tried to work with Democrats on immigration, on education, on Medicare. Uh, and I think this is uh, probably, as Jeb Bush's interview indicates, not the Bush way of looking well, at Republican uh, politics right now. First, Peter's got this great, and I already started reading it, and I don't know if I should because I'm reliving days back, back then. <laughs> that you don't want to remember? That I don't necessarily want to go through again. But I think that 
the fissures of that are, are being exposed in the Republican Party right now are not new today. They, they existed in 2000 when the president ran for election the first time up. He was able to cover up those fissures because of his, his name. He was the dominant candidate. But those fissures started to surface in the midst of that. And how do you coalesce that? And they, they, we, we did that in 2000 and 2004. And then they started surfacing in 2008, which is one of the reasons John McCain. But, but this, but wait, this but seems like much more serious fissures. They seem very different, much stronger. Well, they're stronger. exposed because, well, the, well, I think so. because I mean, the, college, the college establishment is no longer in charge of the dorms. The dorms are in charge. Right. To the college this campus. is a this is a it, it's a different moment because you see I'll call it the kind of the Ron Paul you know movement which all belong to the Republican Party whether you support Ron Ron Paul whether you support Ted Cruz or whether you support Chris Christie we're a big tent Republican Party but I think as a party we've got to have a real conversation about the fact that you can have different views you can vote with the Tea Party eight out of ten times and still be a conservative. The conservative movement has slowly been redefined to what Freedom Works and Club for Growth wanted to look like, which are outside unelected groups run by a couple of 30-year-old staffers. And that's what my concern is. The other point I want to make, though, is this. The President of the United States is the only one, whether he's Democrat or Republican, that can really lead a country together and give a vision. We can do that. I can do that as a member of Congress, but it's not going to have the impact that the President of the United States will. He needs to come out and start to lead the country and say it's time to be unified. He's got three years left to make a name for well, himself. Well, I mean, can, I think it's that? really, look, it's really easy to cast this off on the, on the President, but the fact is when you have now what looks to be a majority of Republicans in Congress who want to stop the president at any uh, point, who want to say, you know, we want to undo your signature health care act and shut down government over that and not pay our bills over that. I mean, that really is very extreme. And I think even a president who, and this president, I think, in my view, as a progressive Democrat, has bent over backwards to try to accommodate uh, the Republican Party and construct this bipartisan support. This doesn't sound support. like we're, well, we're going to do anything <laughs> differently. I think, the, Martha, part of the real problem in this is, and until this part changes, I think that we're going to be in this situation. We need to redefine winning differently. We, re right. we define winning today as us versus them. Right. I'm going to score points, and if I don't score points, I'm going to decide who the winner and the loser is. We just find everything is a battle, everything is a civil war. The president, I think, has tried to balance this tension, but I think he constantly falls into, I think he would like to bring the country together and be accommodating and do all that. He ran on that just like Bush ran on that. The end result of Bush's didn't turn out well. The end result of President Obama's didn't turn out well. But I think President President Obama lapses back into this sort of dualistic thing that, okay, I wasn't able to do it. I'm going to point fingers, and I'm going to. And you watched his speech last week, and his speech last week was a perfect microcosm of it. He's, let's I, change the tone, but maybe let's, not. Let's change the tone, but they're <laughs> at fault. Right? Yeah. Whenever you well, say I they're just, at fault, Matt, you can't come fix on. it. Right? It, it, no. it is really important here. We don't want to do a, a rewrite of this, and in order not to do a rewrite, you actually have to understand who was who was at fault, and there was real fault here. We had a majority of but, Republicans but that again is and Democrats back. who well, wanted to keep the government Peter, open. Peter, like, Peter, let me let me yeah. let me switch a little bit here, and I want you all to talk about a. Obamacare. Obviously, that rollout was not a good one. And I can't imagine the Republicans not using that as ammunition. That wasn't what the Republicans were really worried about. They're worried about the whole Affordable Care Act. But the rollout was so bad. The rollout was terrible. And the, and then the White House knows it. And the truth of the matter is what, what the Republicans have given o President Obama a gift here because, in fact, had, they, right. had this not happened, the narrative Absolutely. for the last few months would have been how Syria went in a way that, you know, was very... Uh, disconcerting to the country, didn't have a lot of support among Democrats. The Democrats forced him to give up on Larry Summers for Fed chief. They're upset about NSA. And then we would have come into the fall and, and the health care rollout would have been bad. Without doing anything, the Republicans would have sat back and watched as things would have gone badly for President Obama politically. And instead now he comes out looking like a winner, or at least feeling like a winner, whether he should or not. That's the political dynamic in Washington today, and he may be re-empowered to some extent. And Democrats, who were pretty upset at him for various things, now are pretty united and happy to watch Republicans fall apart. I tried, I tried signing on the first day, the first or second day, five different times. I was curious to see, like, okay, what it would look like, how the technology... It didn't work. It didn't, no, didn't work, work five straight times when I tried to do it. I always said, listen, it is the law of the land. The Supreme Court said it is the law of the land. Election said it is the law of the land. And I always said the test of this will be in the implementation. The problem for the president and the Democrats in this is the implementation has been disastrous. Okay. Okay. Let me so go around the room very quickly. All of us want to get it right. All Absolutely. of us want to get it right. Everybody wants to get it right, I, I assume. But, but Obamacare is still a huge issue, a huge issue going forward. Just very quickly, all of you going around, will the government shut down again, do you think? Well, it better not. <laughs>
No, I don't think so. And I just want to add, we need to start finding win-wins between yeah. Republicans and Democrats here. I think it's going to shut down again. It may not be for two weeks, because the, the basic Merry problem Christmas. Hasn't, has, yeah. Yeah, okay. hasn't worked, <laughs> hasn't fixed, been fixed. Yeah, Peter? I, I think that's possible. I think, it's, I think Republicans don't want it to happen again. I think they learned that that wasn't necessarily a good thing, but there's no permanent fix at the moment.